So it is my honor to introduce our speakers for today. They are not just part of our Mosaic family, they are our global partners. They work with Alteco and the Three Waves Movement, and they not only partner with the North American church, they work with the local church in South America that goes in and works with the indigenous churches and leaders in the Amazon to reach the unreached people group for Jesus. And I know that we are gonna be blessed by what they have to share with us today. Chris and Tina Ferry. Good morning, family. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Am I on? Yes. Um, I'm Chris. This is Tina. If you don't know us, we are Mosaic Global Partners. And we went, uh, we've been a part of this church for, I don't know, how many years now? Like 20 some years. Yes. Um, these are our daughters, Georgia and Reese. Reese is up serving in Kidmo and George is out there someplace. Um, but it is our pleasure to share with you today. Um, we really want to like kind of encourage you guys and even challenge you a little bit. We were going to share with a little bit what we're, we're doing and also, um, and surprise, surprise, we're going to talk about the Great Commission, but we're going to talk about servanthood and perseverance through discipleship in the Great Commission. Before we get started, can we just pray for our time? Yeah. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you just bless this time. We ask that you bless all the fathers here, and you just continue to give them the strength and the wisdom to lead their families and to feed into their children. Lord, we just... Um, ask that you bless this time, let the Holy Spirit just lead us and guide us, and thank you that you let us be able to come together and worship you. Amen. Amen. So like Chris said, surprise, surprise, missionaries want to talk about the Great Commission. Um, but don't lean back in your seats and say, oh great, we're going to hear stories about what those missionaries do. Um, the Great Commission is the church's homework. Um, we are all commissioned um, to go and make disciples. Um, so we're going to read a verse that we all know to get us started, um, and then we'll dig a little deeper. Matthew 28, um, 16 through 20. I like to read from my paper. Sorry, I know it looks more professional to read from the teleprompter, but we're old school. Um, okay, so verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So you see there where it says, therefore go and make disciples. The Great Commission is not just an evangelistic moment. It is a continual process of discipleship. Yeah, and the Great Commission isn't just for Chris and Tina. It is for you too. The church has a role in this also. You guys are called to make disciples wherever you are. Um, in the Three Ways Movement, um, we want to let you know a little about what we do, just so that you kind of have some context, because we will use verbiage that, uh, when we refer to people. So the idea is the Western missionary, which is us, is the, is the first wave. The second wave is the national missionary, or the Latino blood, and the, and the national church. Then the third wave, as you can see, the, what was Let's up there? Hop back to the photo. Um, <laughs> is the indigenous church or the, indig or, the, or the indigenous believers that are now being mobilized to reach their own people. Yeah, so here you see Chris and Tina Ferry, first wave, Javier Betsabe and Irma, who you met last year, mm -hmm. second wave, and Henrique and Corina, third wave, the indigenous church itself. And together, we aim to strengthen the indigenous church and fulfill the Great Commission in the Amazon together. So the truth of the matter is? What we really do is discipleship. How do you strengthen the church? It's by life on life, accompanying and serving with each other and feeding into one another, and one another, and that is discipleship. So that's what we're doing down in South America, and that's what we want, hopefully you're doing here too, and we want to encourage you to do that also. So we just want to tell a little bit of a story about how Mosaic is having an impact in the Amazon. You've heard us talk about this leadership development training, right? Raise your hand if you've heard the fairies talk about leadership development in the Amazon. <laughs> Awesome. So let's, let's go to the photo showing the first group. If you remember, Mosaic invested three consecutive years in training 35 leaders in the Three Waves movement um, in leadership development. And, um, and now 
we've completed those three years, praise God. It's having incredible impact in six countries in South America, but we didn't stop there. This is a multiplication effort. If you remember, we are going, each of the leaders here are taking it into their own countries. So we've already started this year in Bolivia and Colombia, where the indigenous leaders that receive the leadership training are going in with the indigenous tribal networks and training other leaders. Um, you'll notice that our faces, Chris's and my face, are nowhere on here. And we are so good with that because we are all about strengthening the indigenous leaders to reach and teach their own people. That's a victory, but that doesn't mean that we're removed. We are still active in discipleship, serving and persevering alongside our coworkers. So I wanna be honest with you, discipleship is not without risk, but it does bear good fruit. So as we were planning and going over verses and talking about what do we wanna share, um, we read through all the different versions of the Great Commission, and in Mark 16, the very end of the chapter, um, there's another version of the Great Commission. And it, part of it, it says in there that they will drink poison and not be harmed. So that brought to our mind this story of this missionary who went to Colombia back in World War II, like in 1944. And her story, her name is Sophia Mueller. Um, she's a very interesting lady. She was a journalist working for the New York Times and like an artist. And then God got a hold of her life and she felt compelled to go and serve. Um, so she gets to Colombia. She's in a, we actually brought um, a few people here. Um, Lisa and Jeff went with us. Mark and, and Neva. And Kirk went down there. He was very uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> he did great. He did he, great. He did great, but it was a little hot and a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but anyways, the town we were at, that's where Sophia went to. And when she got there, she started interacting with the tribes. And then after a little while, the shaman or the witch doctor of one of the tribes decided, I'm going to kill this lady off. She's causing all kinds of problems, trying to distract people from what we believe and what we're doing. So he concocted up a poison, to, and this is unfortunately what this tribe did, is they poisoned people. Um, they're kind, we were known for it. Um, she, he made it strong enough to kill five men, and she ate the food, and she felt kind of bad, and then went over and threw up, and then was fine. And then the dogs came, ate the vomit, and immediately died. But as, when that happened, the shaman went, whoa, that lady should have died. Her God is way, way more powerful. So he became a believer, and she started to have a ministry in this area. And, and to this day, we are working with the fruits of her labor. We are, we're, and I'll tie in a little bit of this story, but I don't want you to focus on Sophia. She did get into like 15 different tribes in that area, and her legacy in that area is well established. But what I want you to learn about is who she developed and through discipleship is Isaias Flores. He's a man who came to know Christ through Sophia. He is one of these people that just ooze like Jesus out of him. Like you just come around him and you can just feel the peace and the calmness. But and he's an indigenous leader, a third an, wave indigenous leader. He's a third wave indigenous leader. And the best thing that he has done, he has not just stopped there. He has discipled the next generation of leaders who now we are working with. So three years ago in Colombia, the tribal network was formed and we were present at that. There were about 200 indigenous leaders present. Isaias was there because he's one of the oldest indigenous believers in Colombia. And when they were forming the indigenous tribal network in Colombia, the, the younger indigenous that were more like our age, 40, 50, were talking about who should be the president. And, and everybody elected Isaias. They said he was evangelized by Sophia Mueller. He knows scripture. He definitely should be the president. And he's in his 70s. And, um, and Isaias said, thank you for the honor. Thank you for the vote of confidence. However, I would like to serve the tribal network and be your pastor and persevere by your side, but I do not want position. I want you to step into the leadership and I will accompany you. Is that amazing? And he does. I mean, he circles around those families and disciples them and corrects them very beautifully um, in, in ways that um, really reflect uh, the true heart of discipleship and serving. And that's something um, that Chris and I aim to do. 
That is what we aim to do as we serve in ministry. We want to come alongside South American leaders and put our arm around them. I think we have a photo of, of us in one of our meetings. You'll notice Chris and I are on the, on the sides. That is intentional because we want to raise up and stand behind the leaders as they grow in confidence because they will always say to us, they will always say to people like Isaias, you can do this better, let me follow you. And what we believe we are called into is a discipleship that serves and perseveres alongside. And so we want to talk more about that this morning. But before we go into the scriptures where we're going to talk about that principle biblically, we want to talk a little bit about Chris's relationship with um, Cesar Rodriguez, who uh, Mark and Neva and Lisa and Jeff know, know who Cesar and Solange are. They're awesome leaders. And Chris has this incredible interdependent discipleship relationship with Cesar. Yeah. So on that last photo, he was the short guy that was... That yeah, we could go back so you could see him. Yeah. So he's, the, he's um, one of the people that Isaias has fed into. He's one of the people that Isaias has discipled. He has served with him and persevered with him. Um, he is Puinabi. He's actually the, one of the, the people group that Sophia reached. He, his... Uh, the shaman back then was one of the, was the guy who tried to kill her, uh, but he comes from that people group. But now he has been raised up because of this history, and we get to serve with him. And he's trying to disciple me as I'm trying to disciple him. And that's what we want to kind of talk to you guys about today. Like discipleship isn't just this mentorship example or this mentorship model. It's really serving alongside, coming alongside, and knowing this other person at a relationship in a deep level. When we were in Columbia just a few weeks ago, he decided he wanted to know me better, so he ate everything I ate and drank everything I drank. Um, it was very interesting to watch him react to a double shot of espresso. <laughs> <laughs> this is not his normal thing. He usually would put like six or seven tablespoons of sugar in that just to like tone it down because they don't like bitter things. But it just showed his heart. He wants to know who I am and what makes me tick and how I function. And that was discipling me so that we have this closer bond so that then I can feed into him and have a stronger voice with him. So this type of discipleship, this interdependence, serving one another, creates a beautiful environment in which to work, but it bears good fruit. And we want you to celebrate with us. Actually, this last week, we just got this video. Um, from our coworker, who is one of the members of the tribal network in Brazil. And he is on the front lines reaching into unreached communities and discipling indigenous leaders to go into their neighboring unreached communities. And he just sent us this video and said, look at the fruit of this discipleship movement in South America. So go ahead and watch it. Um, it is a baptism. It's a baptism celebration in an indigenous community. And it gives you a little bit of a glimpse into what God is doing in the Amazon. So that video goes on for a minute and a half. They're worshiping God. They're worshiping God. They, they just baptized people in their community. Paulo Nunes was the man in the green shirt with his arms up worshiping the Lord and indigenous communities. They all speak at once and they all worship at once and they all pray at once and there's this unity that is so beautiful. This is what God is doing through the three, three Waves movement and through Mosaic's investment in us and in the Three Waves movement. So thank you and praise the Lord. You'll notice, again, there were no Westerners present. But that doesn't mean we're not a part of it. We are a part of the discipleship and the accompaniment of this work. And we are happy and celebrating the fact that God is transforming communities without our faces present because these indigenous believers are equipped with the same Holy Spirit that we are, but they have asked that we walk with them, that we disciple and persevere with them. 
All right, so we've shown you a little bit what's happening in South America, but let's talk about what's here. Let's bring it down to mosaic level and little tin. Um, so how do we serve and persevere in discipleship? Um, we want to show you, have the example of Barnabas and Paul, because um, Paul was accompanied by Barnabas. I believe really that he would not have been successful in what he did if he went it alone. And so we're going to read in Acts uh, 9, 26 through 30 about how Barnabas interacted with Paul. Okay, Acts 9, 26 through 30. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. We're talking about Paul. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. All right, so what's happening here? Paul had been persecuting the church. God got a hold of him and said, Paul, you need to, <laughs> you're, what you're doing is wrong. You need to uh, basically reach the people for me. And, um, but how did he, the apostles were afraid of him. He had been killing them off. So uh, Barnabas had a relationship with Paul, which meant they actually had to spend some time together. He had to listen to him. He, they had to talk. They had to know each other. And Barnabas, using his relationship clout with the apostles, was able to vouch for Paul. So part of discipleship is vouching for people. If you think someone should be involved in a ministry, you need to grab them and say, hey, this person would be great serving here. That is part of discipleship, saying Hey, recognizing the strengths of people and putting them before the other people so that they can get involved and encouraging them to get involved. Yeah, Barnabas served Paul by vouching for him. But it goes even further than that. In Acts 13, 2 to 3, we see how Barnabas took it a step further. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them, and they were sent off. So Barnabas went with Paul. Um, he accompanied him. This is discipleship. This is mutual discipleship. When you actually go, you know what? You should serve here too, but I'm going to serve with you. I'm going to be in this life move with you. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to walk down this road with you. And that's discipleship. It's not just mentoring it's actually walking step in step along with the people, encouraging them, being part of their life, knowing them. Um, really, this is where the church grows. This is how we grow as believers. This is how we mutually encourage one another is by walking together and persevering together. Shout out to our life group. Woo, woo. They're a great example of this. When we came and, and switched roles mm -hmm. and based in the U.S. and began traveling, um, to seven different countries, um, almost never home, our life group here at Mosaic stepped up and they came alongside us. They provide, they provide meals for our girls, fruit, transportation, um, prayer. Uh, last October, I'm going to tell you a story um, a little bit later where our small group held up our arms when we felt like we were too weary to continue. Wow, makes me cry. Love you guys. Um, <laughs> So this is discipleship. This is mutual discipleship, interdependence, serving one another and persevering together. Discipleship is truly a servant work. It is not taking a position of power and lording it over others. It is not feeling confident that you have everything to offer somebody, but it is an act of mutual submission. I want to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. So don't close your ears, because this is a verse that we know very well about love. But I want to challenge us to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us, how are we walking alongside one another? How are we discipling in our homes and in our communities, in our church, in a way that reflects true love that is spirit-led? 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7. Love is patient. Love is kind. 
It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. I'm getting teary because this is what we've experienced through our church family here. (laughs) We've been protected. We have been treated in a way that was very generous. Our group believed the best of us. One, One family in our group has had a lot of missionary experience where missions was not a beautiful expression of love and it was power seeking, and they embraced us and said, we're gonna love you through this. And they were relieved to find out that God led us into a ministry where we want to mutually submit and act out of humility. But they they took a risk on us. They invested in us when it was unknown. Um, So the questions that we need to ask ourselves, is our discipleship marked by pride when we engage someone are we acting out of pride are we keeping records of wrongs are we doing it for personal gain or position or are we truly serving in order to disciple and draw people to the feet of Jesus discipleship's not just a servant work it's a perseverant work it's bearing with one another in love You guys know what that feels like to bear with someone? It's when that, you just can't with that person anymore, right? I just can't with you anymore. And what we're called to is a bearing with, a hope with one another. Um, In Ephesians 4, 1 through 2, it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, that's what we all are, prisoners of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then 1 Corinthians 13, 7, going back to that verse, it says, love always perseveres. And I want to share transparently with you this morning one of my experiences in the Three Waves movement, um, serving Um, with the Three Waves Movement now for more than 10 years. Chris and I went to our first encounter with the Three Waves Movement before we committed to serve with them about 13 years ago. And I was one of the only women present out of about 200 people. And I said to Chris, where are the women? There are no women here. And frankly, it kind of got my hackles up because I'm like, what's going on? We're 50% of the population. Where are the ladies? And... But I had a very wise mentor that said, pray, 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 serve, and persevere. And so I did. Mm -hmm. And we moved into the three waves movement, trusting the Lord. Chris encouraged me to serve in my giftings. Um, About eight years ago, I was given, offered a position on the South American leadership team. And I was one of two women on that team. And the only one that was married. And in South America, when you're a woman in leadership, and married, that's a different dynamic than a single woman in leadership. And there were lots of opportunities for confusion, there were lots of opportunities for hurt feelings, um, misconceptions, but our team persevered together and served one another. And I stayed on my knees, Chris was on his knees, asking the Lord to put it on the hearts of the South American leaders to draw more women in. And I just served as the Lord led me to. Well. It's so exciting. You guys met the Three Waves leadership team here, and it's husband and wife. Did you see that last year and the year before? And God's not only bringing up the wives alongside the men as the men lead in their positions of leadership, but he is raising up indigenous women's networks. He is doing this in his perfect time, and he's planted the desire in the hearts of men. And I didn't have to muscle something I didn't have to manipulate anything, but I served and persevered under good counsel. Thank you, Lord. And just last week, we were in Bolivia, and the indigenous tribal network there 
um, had a leadership training like you saw in the photos. And day one, the women were all in the kitchen and the men were in the leadership training. Because that was autopilot, autopilot. And Cesar came to Mirta, his wife, and I was standing next to her, and he said, Mirta, this is not okay. We need the wives in the leadership training with us. They're our co-laborers. We need to reorganize the kitchen plan. And so we reorganized the kitchen plan and all the women went into the training and participated for those five days and were encouraged and mobilized to reach and teach their own people. God is faithful and he sees us and he gives us the strength that we need to persevere. Yeah. And not just that, and then I'll pass it over to Chris, not just that, in October we have all of the tribal networks coming together in Ecuador. It's a 70 indigenous leaders. And the men who lead the tribal networks when they were planning this event said, can we trust God for the finances to bring our wives? And so they are all working in their countries, yeah. raising money so that their wives can be present as well. Um, and they, at, in October, will form the Trans-Amazon Women's Tribal Network. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. All right, so we're gonna go back to discipleship. I'm a very visual learner, so I was trying to think of, like, how can we explain this in a way that, like, the other people who aren't auditory learners will understand? So I have two models that I wanna to show to you. The first one is the passing of the baton in a relay race. Usually there's four people in the race, and as they're running, they run around the track, and then they hand off the baton to the next person. They do run with them for a little bit, but I wanna to say to you that this is not a very good model of discipleship. Um, this is a very often a used model of discipleship, but it's not what we need right now. And it could because the person who hands off the baton stops running. Nowhere in the Bible can I find anywhere where it tells me once you pass off your stuff, just stop. You're supposed to keep running with perseverance and continue the race. So the other model that I want to like, present to you is drafting in a bicycle race. Hopefully this will be something that you've seen in the Tour de France or something like that so that you can kind of understand it. So the person in the front, they are pushing through the wind. They are doing a lot of the hard work. The person behind them, depending on how close to them, actually can, has to work 40% less. So they get to save energy. They get to build and recover. And, and then actually the person in the front gets a 4% um, benefit because the, there's less turbulence behind them. But the coolest thing about this is that they get to switch. Once the person behind is rested, they get to go up front and they get to push and drive forward and bring the whole team farther along. So, this is how discipleship, in my mind, should work. We should be going together. Sometimes it's my job to be up front. I know with Cesar Rodriguez in Colombia, right now I need to be pushing for him so that he is ready to go in the next season because he is going to have a lot of things that he needs to be doing and have the energy for. Um, so hopefully this makes sense in your head that my job is to figure out who I'm supposed to be going with and who is blocking for me, and then how can I then, then block for them? So we see this in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for, before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Yeah, so it says in there that we need to go with perseverance, run with perseverance. Discipleship helps us do that. Um, when we were in Colombia, um, three, years three years ago, with that 200 people, they asked Tina and I, how long are you with us? And we were kind of puzzled by the question. Like, like what do you mean? Like, wh how long are we with you? You're, we're part of you. We're with the Three Waves movement. We were going to be with you as long as God tells us to be with you. 
And, and that's a question yeah. of the people that we disciple a lot, isn't it? How long are you with me? Are you going to pass the baton and be done? Or are you going to truly walk with me? So our encouragement is, is start to discipling and don't grow weary. Persevere with one another. And so this has some applications for Mosaic. Yeah, so we want to remind you that the Great Commission is your homework. Can you say that? The Great Commission is my homework. <laughs> the, my daughter hates it when we do that in church. She says it creeps her out because it sounds like everybody is chanting together. The, the Great Commission is our homework. And just like Sophia Mueller, discipleship is a love response. It's an action of gratitude for what we have received, the love that we experience on a daily basis. But we need to keep it simple. We need to not get frozen when it says, make disciples. I think that our minds immediately go to, well, what curriculum would I use? What classroom do I have available to me? Who do I disciple? Who do I disciple? What could anyone learn from me? Or, even more dangerous, People could learn a lot from me, right? Let's keep it simple. The questions we ask ourselves is, who can I serve and persevere with? Who can I serve and persevere with? Yeah, so, and to be a Barnabas, find people, vouch for them, and then accompany them in that. Um, I think there's a statistic about 10% of the church serves and gives. That's statistically over churches. That's how it goes. Only 10% of the church is actually really involved. I'd like to challenge Mosaic to flip that around and have 90% of the church serving and involved in giving and doing, and 10% warming the seats. Hopefully, you guys will feel encouraged to do that. That would be a beautiful thing. That's how we're going to see this church grow, because we're in a harder season right now, and we all know it. But that's how we're going to survive and strengthen and come alongside one another. It's going to be hopefully beautiful to see when all this starts to, the fruit of it develops. Because we're seeing this in South America. We're seeing amazing things happening. Unreached people groups are being reached. God is moving amazingly. But he also wants to see things move here and grow here and people being reached. Are you ready to go deeper into conviction with me? Um, we, no, <laughs> uh, we, um, we want to challenge you to personally ask the Holy Spirit to convict you of the areas where you are not coming alongside where you should. This can be in your home. This can be with your spouse. This can be with your kiddos. This can be in your workplace. But open yourselves up to the blessing of obeying the Lord in your role. Chris and I are blessed. Our socks are blessed off. And we have completely laid our life down for the kingdom. And it does not get easier. It's harder. Every year we do this, it's harder. But it is a bigger blessing to us as well. There is a blessing in it. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you how you're acting are you acting out of impatience and pride or selfishness or unforgiveness? Are you walking with an attitude that's hopeless? Because we have hope available to us. And we serve the king that raises up indigenous in the Amazon and they shout in worship for an hour when one person gets baptized. That is the God we serve. And that is the God that will empower you as you obey him. Um, we were talking to Ben this week. Um, I don't know that this announcement has been made just yet, but um, we'll be the first to tell you if it hasn't. On the 23rd at Mosaic here, there's a volunteer. And that's when you get to go around and see the different ministries that God is doing here at Mosaic. Um, I, when somebody first talked to me about the volunteer, I said, well, oof, my plate's full. I am serving. I'm one of the 10%. But Chris and I want to encourage you to go on the volunteer anyways, if you're one of those people. See what God is doing through your co-laborers. Be encouraged. Affirm them. 
Know your church family in that way. If you are not serving, go see what's happening and then seek God's face as to what you should or should not do. Don't avoid the volunteer just because you don't want to be pressured into serving. I know the leadership here at this church and they will not pressure you into serving. They want you to obey the Lord and we do too. But you have to open your eyes to those opportunities first. They may vouch for you and encourage you though. Um, Which we believe they should do. Yes. But we just want to encourage you guys to don't grow weary. Um, finish the race that has been placed before you. Um, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And also consider serving uh, with Jesus and in your community. Because um, no man is worthy, but God is. We just want to encourage you guys to serve and persevere. And that's our encouragement for you today. Can we pray for you? Yeah. Uh, Lord, we just come before you. Um, we are just humbly before you trying to obey what you've asked us to do, Lord, as part of this church. And we just know that you love this church and you love the people in it and you love the community, Lord. So we just ask that you continue to bless them and encourage them and grow them, Lord. And Lord, we ask all of this in your name. Thank you so much. We want to actually take a few minutes to pray over Chris and Tina as well. And I think it would be so appropriate to invite your life group to come on up. Any of them that are here today, and pray over both of you and your ministry. We love you both. You are so inspiring. Thank you so much. I am also inviting uh, Lisa McRae. She oversees our, our missions here and our missions global partners. She supports them throughout the year, so I would like her up here as well. At this time, I'm going to hand this over to Sean Blaney to pray over them. Hey, people. Um, <clears throat> before I pray, I just wanted to share something shared it with our life group. We had a, um, I had a, a professor that was a missionary for years. She said something, I never forgot it. She said, prayer doesn't help the work of missions. Prayer is the work of missions. Like this moment is so incredible. We're about to speak into heaven and the hand of almighty God is gonna break into this world for us. And not because of our goodness, but because of his. And you say all the time, we go together. So we go before you in prayer. We go with you in prayer. And I thank you for this moment. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, our good Father, our creator God, who made Chris and Tina and rejoiced over their creation and, and designed them and built them with gifts. And they shine for you in a way that no one else can in their uniqueness. We praise you. We ask for your name to be glorified. We ask for the fame of your name to spread in the Amazon through Chris and Tina, through El Teco, the Three Waves Movement. We pray for your kingdom work. Uh, we pray for your spirit to be moving in a way that only you can through us. Um, and I, I was touched by some of the words said here, not just kingdom work in the Amazon, but just the kingdom work all around us, um, especially amongst friends and family and um, in our marriages and in our, in our lives of our kids. We ask that your will be done. Not always an easy prayer, as modeled by Christ. And we've, we have had the privilege of walking through some great things with the fairies. And uh, we've seen them when they're in the valley too. Uh, but the beautiful thing is nothing surprises you, Lord. All things are from you. And so we just pray that you just be with them in the mountaintops and they can praise you and see your goodness. And, and when they go through hard things, and they will, that they'll be walking in your strength, accompanied by you, and have peace that transcends understanding because they know that you're in control. We ask for their daily bread, which means that you will meet their needs. And you're a good father and you know our needs. You know the, the needs of today, the needs of tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Um, and the greatest thing we need is you, Lord. You are the true manna come down from heaven. And I just pray that they would have more of you, Christ. And Lord, we are a people who aren't perfect, and we sin. And you know that. 
and you love us regardless. Lord, we sin and we make mistakes um, in our thoughts and our words and what we do and what we fail to do. Um, you ask us to be like you, to be full of love, mercy, grace, truth, uh, and we misstep, and you're quick to forgive you. Though our sins be red as scarlet, you make us white as snow. You remove all of our iniquity as far as the east is from the west. And the fairies know this for themselves. And they've been given the mission of spreading that that wonderful truth that we can stand before holy God and be blameless because of the work of Christ. I pray that the they'd be ambassadors of reconciliation and your 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 gospel truth of reconciliation would just continue to spread through the Amazon. I'll lead them, guide them by your spirit. Um, our battle is not against just flesh and blood, but against forces and of darkness and principalities. And, and he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And we just ask with confidence that your power would continue to be demonstrated in massive ways for, for the indigenous people. So, Lord, we ask that your spirit would strengthen them in their inner being with the strength that only you provide, that Christ would sit on the throne of their hearts, they would never forget their first love, and they'd be filled to the fullness of God. And if we think we've asked too much, we're reminded by Paul's words, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think or imagine, be glorified, God. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who is the spotless lamb who takes away the sins of the world, our covenant keeper, who sits at your right hand, enthroned in glory, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We pray this in the confidence of Christ. Amen. Amen. And if you want to know more... Um, if you want to know more about what we're doing, there should, we want to put up a QR code real, real quick. Just take that, or you can sign up for our newsletters in the back and grab a prayer card also. We'd love to chat with you, and thank you so much.